This session dives into this game changer of integrating climate change, sustainability with business, and introduces the rising market standards and equal, equally important how the corporate performance on climate change sustainability will be measured and evaluated. Our panelists are distinguished practitioners in their private sector, so the challenges and opportunities of climate change sustainability will also be put on the spotlight. Um, now, uh, let me introduce Ravi Chidambaram, uh, founder of TC Capital. Can you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Uh, sure, thank you, you. My name is Ravi Chidambaram. Um, I'm based in Singapore. I'm the founder and CEO of TC Capital, which is an investment banking firm. Over the last seven, eight years, I've been very active, very active in the sustainability field. Mm -hmm. First, as an investor in various social enterprises in the ASEAN region where I'm based. Uh, second, as a professor of sustainability at Yale and US College in Singapore, where I teach a class called The Good Company. And third, more recently, as the founder and CEO of a company in Singapore called RIM Sustainability, um, which is a SaaS platform focusing on helping companies improve their sustainability performance. Thank you. Oh, that's, well, that's exciting. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to turn to uh, Kyohei. Can you brief, uh, Kyohei Hosono of Dream Incubator, can you briefly um, introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, Yusan, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kyohei Hosono. I'm a Chief Operative Officer, Operation Officer of the Dream Incubator Inc., which is a Japanese strategic consulting company and an investment company. Uh, we have offices all around, all around the Asia, so in Southeast Asia and India. Uh, in the area of strategic consulting, uh, we have been receiving uh, a great deal of the requests from the Japanese clients for the project related to the carbon neutrality, in particular, DI Dream Incubator, we often assist in the development of the new technologies as well as the business models for Japanese companies. Now it's getting more and more difficult for a single company to realize a business that can bring about some major social reforms. For example, uh, you know, research and development of hydrogen for the carbon neutrality is progressing all over the world. But for this kind of the business, hydrogen, it is necessary to build a hydrogen value chain starting from the, you know, the production, transportation, separation, and you know, CCS, you know, carbon uh, CCS. So it is getting quite difficult for a single company to promote such a complex businesses by just one company. So we are typically specialized in specialized in involving the multiple private companies and the government. To, to build a large platform and establishing the new, new rules and promote public-private sector partnerships for these purposes. So uh, we are, I'm very happy to have a chance to talk with all of you guys here for the, you know, for this important topics today. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Kyohei. Uh, I'm gonna first uh, start asking question to Ravi. Um, how are the rules of the game in business changing due to the climate change agenda? Yes, I think if you're a CEO or founder of a company these days and you're thinking about climate change, you need to consider uh, two different types of aspects. The first is measuring and planning. Um, and the second is to understand the consequences, the practical impacts it can have on your business. Let's start with the first part. Um, it's very hard to have a decarbonization strategy or plan if you don't first measure uh, your carbon footprint. And this is, of course, far more difficult, you know, than we think. Um, you know, there is the relatively straightforward scope one and scope two direct emissions that companies can emit. But even this will vary tremendously by country, by industry, and so on. So... Um, it's very important first to develop accurate measurement standards and there are various tools in the market, including ours at RIM. But then there's also the more complex and evolving scope three. And scope three is very important in an Asian context because it captures the emissions in the supply chain. Asia being a major part of the global manufacturing um, hub, 
uh, it's very, very important to understand scope three. It's also very important to understand consumers' consumption um, around scope three. It has to be said so far, there is no completely accurate uh, methodology for scope three, but companies have to begin to think about how to do scope three. The overlay on the measurement also includes standards. You probably have heard of TCFD. TCFD is an emerging standard around climate disclosure that's become standard practice for many stock exchanges for bigger companies. I understand it's coming to Japan next year as well. It's already a standard in the UK, Switzerland, Australia, and so on. So this will force large companies to develop climate scenario planning and what their decarbonization paths can be and you know, disclose that in their annual reports. The other thing is the EU taxonomy. The EU taxonomy will come into effect in 2024 and it has relevance for Asian companies. The reason is because of scope three and the supply chain. Because so much of the supply chain for European companies are in Asia, European companies under the EU taxonomy, companies with more than 500 employees, will have to disclose their supply chain emissions in Asia through scope three. That means Asian companies who are suppliers to these types of European companies will have to start understanding the scope three uh, taxonomy. Mm -hmm. So that is sort of the measuring part. So their standards and their definitions around scope one, scope two, scope three. Sorry for the long answer, but let me continue. The next is that mm -hmm. leads to planning. Once you know what your carbon footprint is, and you can break it down by different types of emissions. As a board, as a management team, you can begin to work towards, you know, the fashionable terms, carbon neutral, net zero, and so on. And that's a combination of strategies to change the energy mix at companies away from fossil fuels to renewables. It's also process technologies to reduce emissions in every step of your manufacturing or transport process. But it also could include carbon offsets because carbon offsets means that you create activities that save carbon and that can balance out the activities where you emit carbon. So there's a very large uh, carbon trading market that's evolving in different countries. Um, and that really leads to the planning part. Now, how quickly you plan and uh, how deeply you plan is a function of where you live because regulations in different governments will dictate uh, maybe how you will go about this. So in Asia, there's no one rule and one size fits all. Uh, so it will depend on where you are. But all the countries have some legislation in the works or in place where the planning will have to follow a certain time horizon, okay? Now the practical consequences for companies Companies that do not take into account a decarbonization strategy in the near future face certain disadvantages. The first is they probably will face some sort of impact on their financial statements. You've probably heard of things like integrated financial accounting and ISSB. This means that carbon taxes or the externalities related to carbon emissions will have to be shown on the P&L it will flow through the profit and loss, and it will adjust the profit and loss negatively if your emissions are above baseline standards for your industry. Already some large companies like Danone, the French food company, voluntarily disclose the carbon tax, even though France does not yet have a carbon tax. Many investors are asking to see the financial impact of the emissions that companies have, um, and therefore there will be a financial impact. So the more emissions you have, probably the lower the profits you will report. And that is a problem for CEOs. So they have to deal with it. Uh, and it will most likely be in the form of a tax. We don't know the amount. It will vary again by jurisdiction. Maybe it's $50 a ton, roughly, of excess emissions. The second area is capital markets access and investor perception. Companies that pollute, companies that emit, I think will not be in favor when it comes to raising money in the debt markets and equity markets. And I think they face either lack of access to funding or they will face more expensive funding options. Banks are integrating um, more and more sustainability and carbon checks in their credit 
uh, process and their loan extensions. Um, and capital markets investors f- focusing on equity also are doing the same. So companies will be tested in terms of their due diligence uh, on their readiness for decarbonization and access to capital markets and funding costs. So that's sort of a long-winded answer on why company CEOs need to begin to think about decarbonization plans. Well, that that laid out perfectly. And then how ready are they uh, in Asia, for example? Well, this is really hard to say because it depends on the country. You know, Asia, as you pointed out, is very heterogeneous and diverse. It also depends on the size of the company. Now, one of the myths about decarbonization, of course, is that really only the heavily emitting industries, right, like energy companies, electricity uh, companies, and so on, transportation companies, they're the only ones who really need to worry about decarbonization. And if you're um, a supply chain company or an e-commerce company, you know, it's not so important. Um, There's some truth to this. And it's true that the companies in more heavily emitting sectors like steel, energy, and so on, should pay more attention because they're having a bigger impact. They have a bigger share of emissions today. It's true. But the reality is, as I said, because of scope three, emissions happen in every business, whether they happen directly through manufacturing or indirectly, right, through transportation and consumption. So even an e-commerce company in Japan should pay attention to its emissions because they don't make anything, but they transport a lot of goods. Their consumers consume a lot of goods. And therefore, even they need to think about decarbonization because they're contributing to the carbon footprint. So first, we need more awareness amongst companies, larger and smaller, that it matters to them, that they too can make a difference and they too will face the consequences. And second, we need strong legislation in different countries uh, to force companies to comply uh, with a decarbonization measurement approach and a plan approach. That was that's a very interesting point. And on uh, what are the advantages that a uh, um, Asian business community have compared to the rest of the world in um, in terms of measuring planning or you know integ- I, I mean implementation. Well, I think the one advantage Asia has is that in Asia, governments and businesses work very closely together. There is a lot of top-down, you know, sort of planning in every economy in Asia, regardless of whether it's rich or emerging. So, in that sense, there is a lot of high-level commitment in Asia, um, and you see. Um, carbon uh, neutrality, uh, net zero type uh, pledges in almost every major Asian country, Japan, China, Indonesia, India, and so on. Uh, These are the biggest emitters. And then on top of that, a lot of government assistance is starting to appear. You probably, some of it is multilateral, some of it is within the country, but you probably saw at COP26, Japan has pledged $10 billion to ASEAN, you know, the region where I operate, uh, to help companies in ASEAN reduce their carbon footprint. This is a great example of multilateral cooperation. I understand that different uh, agencies in Japan, like JBIC and others, will step up uh, to help fill that. So one thing about Asia is that I think there's good intergovernmental coordination and some high-level commitment. You know, whereas in places like the United States, it will always be a private sector driven approach and less of a regulatory driven approach. So in that sense, Asia can be hopeful that governments will take a strong stance on this and force companies to disclose more about their emissions and their plans to reduce them uh, and offer assistance where needed. Uh, So that's probably the single biggest advantage. But the flip side is Asia faces probably the biggest challenge around decarbonization because so much of Asia is growing and it's emerging. So how do you tell the Indian government or the Indonesian government or the Vietnamese government uh, to adopt very stringent emission standards when their growth depends tremendously on normal fuels uh, and energy, energy mainly, uh, conventional energy? So this is a challenge. How do you get growth in Asia while also improving the environment and decarbonizing? Mm -hmm. 
this is probably a challenge that Asia faces more acutely than any region because it's the fastest growing region. It has the highest population and growth mm -hmm. is a, a huge imperative. So this is, um, this is something we can discuss as we continue the panel today. But I think that, that, um, that that's, that's a big issue. Yeah, well, thank you so much for pointing out that's a terrific, um, you know, point that I definitely want to touch on later. Um, well, I'm going to turn to uh, Kyohei. Um, can you introduce yourself? I mean, you already gave an introduction and then also the uh, what you do and then how it relates to the climate change. Uh, okay, you thank you a... very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... You and uh, Ravi san, thank you very much for a good, nice introduction for this panel. Yes. Actually, I fully agree with your idea that Asia has, uh, you know, strong challenges towards the, you know, decarbonization, as, even as compared to the European countries. So today, well, I want to emphasize is a, uh, you know, you know, climate change, change is a global issue, so that we cannot wait to address. In Europe and every, you know, elsewhere, there is a race to introduce the renewable energy and to develop the new technologies. And Europe currently is leading the, you know, the world, the way in making the rules on the climate change and is trying to bring about a global game change. On the other hand, Asian countries, even including Japan, with the exception of some big countries like China or India, we are far behind in the introduction of the renewable energy and the potential of the introduction of the rene renewable energy itself is considerably inferior to, the, to that of the European countries. So that is a point. So there is a concern that Japan and Asia will be placed in a quite disadvantageous situation in the new economic model promoted by the European countries, which, you know, so it is my my it is essential for Asian countries, Japan and the other countries to work together to develop the technologies and uh, you know create the rules that can compete with those of the Europe in order to realize a carbon neutral society while uh, bringing the the new economic model into the uh, into the new society. So today I would like to discuss these points with with the audience and the, the panelists as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, now uh, it, it looks like Abby joined us. Um, hi, Abby. Uh, welcome. And then, uh, can you uh, uh, give a brief introduction of yourself and what you do to the audience? Sure. Thanks so much, uh, Miyagi san. Um, my name is Abby. Um, Abby Lausha, everywhere you can refer to me as Abby. I founded a company called Blue Sky Analytics three years ago. Um, our mission and vision is to do very active carbon emissions monitoring throughout the globe using satellites and AI. So at the moment, we analyze about 40 to 50 terabytes of data, which is huge volume. And we monitor um, a lot of air pollution across India, forest fires across the world. Uh, we measure carbon emissions from forest fires across the world, um, I think, with a frequency of five to six times a week compared mm. to the previous data sets on the same topics were about two, da two data points per year. So you can really see the kind of you know, exponential ex uh, amplification that happens in the resolution, both uh, spatial and temporal resolution of the data. We are now actively monitoring a lot of coal power plants and industries, which was my dream since when I started the company. We wanted to be able to monitor power plants from space uh, without you know, them knowing per se and get like in very proactive environmental monitoring. Uh, our vision is that, you know, as we get into the 2020s, this decade, and as you know, Ravi was mentioning that every other country and industry is having these net zero pledges. Every bank has certain set of pledges around, we are not going to do deforestation, we're going to do environmental investments. Uh, who is going to monitor and see if we are complying? There has to be a compliance and auditory framework around everything. And this has to be more on third party observations rather than self-reporting because we've seen self-reporting doesn't work. And also because we have the technological cap capacity to do third party monitoring on this. And apart from just monitoring emissions and pollution, we also do very active monitoring of our resources. 
So we monitor lakes and rivers and see how they're expanding or contracting and are able to provide information on climate risk, on droughts and floods, so that the countries and populations can also very proactively do adaptation around this thing. Um, so very excited to be in a part of this session and love to chime in on different technological aspects. Great, thank you so much. Well, Ravi actually earlier um, pointed out about the difficulty uh, and the challenges of accurate measuring and on uh, how uh, you are, uh, it could help uh, companies to um, accurately measure, uh, you know, what they were producing or what they should suppress and then, you know, get all the data. How, how does it help? Um, so definitely the monitoring network, uh, including the sensors and the IOTs and satellites, it's all going through a very exponential growth in the last three to five years. You know, we've had very high proliferation of IOT sensors across industries, from water monitoring, monitoring from temperature monitoring. Uh, even in the city, cities are putting many low cost sensors to be able to get a lot of data points. Or in forests, now you have these technologies where old phones are used in forests to get sense of deforestation. Whenever there's a sound of an ax cutting a tree, the phones trigger. Mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of all of these on ground monitoring and satellite based monitoring that is going to be very powerful. What needs to happen is a little more investment in the monitoring infrastructure. A challenge we commonly face is like, who's gonna pay for it? Uh, and that is probably the challenge of environment, you know? And uh, I think uh, in the early 2000s, there was a Nobel laureate from University of Indiana who mentioned that environment suffers the biggest problem of commons, which is everybody uses it, but nobody wants to be responsible for it. And that is kind of similar with environmental monitoring. Everybody will benefit from it and everybody is going to use it, but who is going to develop it and who's going to proactively put investment and trust that let me put 10 million and let me get this data set and then that data set is going to make things happen. Uh, but I feel mm -hmm. the whole investor network is changing and people are getting a little more sort of forward looking in terms of taking risks on some of the, these technologies and their development mm -hmm. because it's all software, mm -hmm. and all data, so it can be developed at a much faster pace than some of the hardware technologies that we're talking about. Um, so I feel like in the next three, four years, there's going to be very exciting sort of happenings in this industry. Mm -hmm. And by 2025, mm -hmm. thanks to the new tech, we should be able to have a very proactive uh, monitoring framework as a planet. Mm. Excellent. So do you have um, any idea how it's gonna be funded? Or do you, do you have any idea about how you would frame, you know, the stakeholders to, to fund the, the, those monitoring systems? You know, in, um, I think in early nine, late 90s or early 2000s, when Google was raising, raised their $25 million round, there was an article in Business Insider saying that, oh my God, what is this company? They've just raised 25 million, some VC has invested. They will never make money because who's gonna pay for it? So there is an article, I'll send you the link, it's on Business Insider. And you know, we know today Google is a trillion dollar company. So I feel it all takes like one person to really bet on you. There's a lot of capital in the market. I'm saying that the monitoring infrastructure needs in millions of dollars, not even billions of right. dollars. Like, so all it takes is like one or very few investors to really bet on this, that, hey, go build it and let's see how it happens. Uh, you know, um, yeah. So I feel that, you know, uh, there are companies like Tomorrow, which has raised 200 million and is like sort of building on it. Uh, I feel that same thing is going to happen for Blue Sky and other companies in the network. And over time, we are going to be able to deliver that. Mm -hmm. Also, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, your project with Mr. Agor uh, on the Climate Trace project. Yeah. Can you tell us about what you do with him? Sure. So, I mean, I think for every environmentalist out there, Al Gore was the first person who made like environment cool and environment relevant. I feel um, I often have this joke that if you have to make like a movie, like a post-apocalyptic movie in which the protagonist finds a time machine and goes back, probably they will go back to the election and get Al Gore as president because a lot of things on you know, climate change will be scared. Uh, so it was his dream, like many other environmentalists, to do active carbon emissions monitoring because most of the numbers are self-reported and you know most of the numbers are annual inventories. And that's just not good enough in 2021 to take action. 
Uh, so what we do as part of the coalition, it's a coalition of about eight different members who are all sort of experts in either satellite-based environmental monitoring or different kinds of emissions inventories. And we are calculating uh, emissions from different sources. So whether it's power plants, industries, oceans, uh, shipping, roads, transportation, energy, forest fires, biomass burning, all those kinds of sectors on a sort of real-time basis. And we're all striving and working to get our resolutions higher and higher, almost down to asset level. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I want to touch on a little bit about technology and innovation. Um, Kyohei, maybe you can um, start with, uh, and then I'm going to turn to Ravi later um, as an you know investor's uh, point of view. Uh, Kyohei, uh, in terms of the transforming to green energy, what will be the game changer or catalyst for the strong integration and innovation of technology? for the energy supply chain in, uh, in Asia. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's actually really a tough question, you know, who, how to change the games, how to develop, the, transform the new technologies, uh, you, know, for the, you know, for the development of the new uh, you know, en renewable energies as well. Uh, let, let me just show some slides for the audience to understand what is a challenge for, you know, Asia and Japanese companies are facing right now so that the people have a good sense of the carbon neutrality. Can you, can you see this? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Okay, first, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the power, uh, the CO2 emissions of the Japanese, you know, in, in Japan. And when we think about the CO2 emissions, we divide them into the three sections. One is, is the power section, number one, and non-power sector, and the absorption or carbon removal. So Japan is now, is an, in 2020, we are producing 1.1030 uh, millions tons of the CO2s. Uh, so for, to reduce this uh, carbon emissions to nearly to zero by 2050, a lot of the actions are necessary. Uh, so as you show on the left side, uh, for the power sectors, specific methodologies include the introduction of the renewable energy sources, hydrogen and ammonia with overseas uh, CCS. CCS is a technology to you know, capture and store the CO2 into the under the ground. Also restarting the nuclear power generation. All of these kind of the combination of methodologies are necessary for Japanese companies and the you know Asian countries. But here um, this is this is showing the, the possibility of the carbon renew, carbon neutrality uh, for Japan in terms of the renewable energy. Uh, in 2018, this graph is showing, you know, 77% of the electricity is, you know, originated from the fossil fuels. So the rest is from the renewable energy, 23%. So we have to increase this, you know, hopefully up to 60%. But from our perspective, 60% is a sort of the maximum that we can develop. Uh, so hydropower is currently 8%, but, you know, Japan has a little room for the additional development. Uh, if we look at the renewable energy, uh, you know, solar power, we can estimate that we can up to 25%, but Japan has already the largest amount of the solar power installed per land area in the world. So to add more, we imagine the solar panels on the walls, not just on the roof. So if we, it, it's such a, such, a, such a world where you will see a society full of the solar panels everywhere. Onshore wind power now accounts for 10%. Offshore wind power and offshore wind power, which has a more challenging technology, we, you know, even if we put it in, it can be 15%. So uh, even if we try to add all of these potential technologies into the place, then, you know, if we can achieve 60%, 70%, 80%, 
as of the total power generation by the renewable energy is a quite a challenging numbers. So we need to have the, you know, the technology transformation for these sectors, sectors to develop the, to achieve the carbon neutral faster. And then here is uh, some of the ideas, uh, you know, what sort of the technologies are necessary in Japan and in the rest of the world to develop, uh, to achieve the carbon neutrality. So here, uh, as you see now to, from 2020, uh, we have to reduce the existing coal uh, power plant or existing air energy power plant nearly zero towards the 2015. But instead, we have to develop the newly establishing ammonia monofiring power plant, for example. Also, we have to develop the new technologies for the CCS. Also, the hydrogen co-financing a mono-firing kind of the system is really, really necessary to achieve the carbon neutrality towards the 2015. So this sort of the, the technologies development are now uh, you know, tried by the different you know, countries in Japan, companies in Japan, as well as the, the, through the collaboration with Asian countries. So not, just, so not only for the technology transformation of, uh, of the you know, monitoring as well as the measurement of the, the carbon, carbon high, uh, CO2, uh, the tech development of these you know, quite difficult technologies are also quite necessary for the achieving the carbon neutrality in 2050. That is a big challenge for Japan and the Asian countries as well. Mm. Okay, I will stop here. Okay, well, that was terrific. It was interesting. Ravi, would you like to comment on that? And especially, you, you know, it seems like there are a lot of rooms for uh, cooperation in, um, in, in terms of technologies and then in Asia. Yes, you, yeah. Um, as I argued earlier, I think in Asia, decarbonization will follow a slightly different path than in the West. I think Kyohei argued this as well. Um, in my view, I don't think Asians uh, will pursue a decarbonization plan um, solely for its own sake. I think it will have to go hand in hand with the growth agenda and imperative and the pressure that many countries face around growth. So therefore, from an investment perspective or from um, a business idea, entrepreneurship perspective, I think what Kyohe touched on will be crucial. Uh, and, you know, I think what that means is it will have to be around renewables. You know, renewables will be one of the big themes in every Asian country. We've seen this already in India, that some of the most valuable companies to be built in India in recent years are companies focusing on um, solar uh, and wind to a lesser extent. The regimes in the countries have gotten better in terms of pricing, in terms of grid access and so on. Uh, and therefore the commercial opportunity has gotten better and entrepreneurs have taken advantage of it. In ASEAN, you know, the region where I operate more, last year was a watershed year. It was the first year where more energy that came online in ASEAN came from renewables, actually, than conventional energy sources. That's a major milestone in a region that's known especially for its coal-fired plants. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, that's a tremendous breakthrough. Vietnam, Laos, mm -hmm. Cambodia mm -hmm. leading the way in hydro. Uh, Indonesia mm -hmm. leading the way in solar and so on. So this is a great achievement, I think, in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And it shows, again, the potential for entrepreneurs in the renewable uh, field. Japan has a key role to play in all this because Japan probably is the technology leader in the Asia region, right, for renewables because of their leadership in solar uh, their coming expertise in hydrogen. It makes a lot of sense uh, under the new COP26 announcement and the cooperation and the $10 billion investment that um, Japan would like to make in ASEAN to transfer <coughs> and cooperate on more of those types of renewable energy technologies to, to bring to uh, the Asian region. So I think that that really is the biggest single opportunity for investment and entrepreneurship, which doesn't sacrifice the growth agenda but decarbonizes at the same time. However, 
I think Abi also touched on some interesting areas. There's some very interesting reforestation type technology companies that are coming up, which I think are worth keeping an eye on. I think those also uh, in the supply chain, uh, you know, we talked about scope three. That's a big part of the emissions mix in Asia. And I think that there are some very interesting uh, companies coming around process technologies and so on in that area, too. Mm. We should also keep an eye on some of those areas outside of renewables. Again, it would not sacrifice the Asian growth model, uh, but still effectively decarbonize. So I think that's the theme mm. we should always look for in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, related, related to what you just mentioned, I want to also touch on uh, the root making uh, process and um, and on uh, Asian countries are it seems like a, it, there's a big difference in in terms of the environment and then geographical uh, differences uh, if you compare it to Europe or the United States which are especially Europe which is uh, leading the discussion the the root making uh, in climate change and then um, how and then also as you mentioned earlier the the relationship with the government or registration and the private sectors a little different um in asia if you compare to europe or america can you maybe uh, uh talk about like how the rule making can be done and if there's uh, any uh, cooperations uh among asian countries well, as we already saw with COP26, this is a tremendous challenge. And as Abi also touched on, it's very difficult to get international coordination around regulatory policy on key climate change types of issues. I'm not very optimistic about this, to be honest. I think um, this goes beyond decarbonization as well. You know, in general, you know, there's this so-called rules-based order, you know, around trade, mm -hmm. around funding. Um, around patents, around so many areas, which, to be honest, sort of just reinforce the power base, you know, of the richer countries, especially Western countries, at the disadvantage of Asian countries and, and other poor countries. And I think a lot of those countries bristle at this so-called rules-based order um, because they view it as a way of holding them back in their development under the guise of, you know, having rules and order. So I think we have to be a little bit careful. This is a little bit of an emotional and sensitive subject. And I don't think you're going to go to China or Indonesia or India and tell them, you know, well, you have to now follow this rules based order and sacrifice your own domestic growth agenda. I don't think this will work. So I honestly do not think a global rules based order will drive the way here. I think Asian countries do understand because, you know, you see it. You know, I'm sure like if you saw Abhi's data and all that, India, you know, is an absolute climate catastrophe, right? Um, you know, so ASEAN, uh, just the air conditioning bills have shot up tremendously in the last five years because of global warming in the region, right? Um, climate change is felt very acutely in Asia. And I think Asian governments themselves understand that. And I think they will work to develop ideas that fit their own agendas. But I don't think they will become slavish followers of the rules-based order to do so. And I think it's unwise also for a continent like Europe, which is effectively a degrowth continent, right, to be imposing a climate change agenda on the rest of the world. That, that's, that's, mm. that's my view on that. Mm. Interesting. Uh, does Abby want to comment on that? Do you want to have anything on that? <laughs> Definitely. I think I would also say that it's very unfair for a continent like either US or Europe, which does have 20 to, you know, 30 times the emissions per capita than any of the Asian countries to impose any rule based order like the, the growth model of the US world, um, has got us here. So I just do not feel that any degrowth or any decarbonization model proposed by either of those sort of economies is going to be wise. Uh, I do want to add on the fact that, you know, climate change, pollution, plastics, environmental problems, they're all very interlinked. And as Ravi said, they're felt very closely at home, not just by the governments, but by people at large. Mm -hmm. So as these countries mm -hmm. start to grow and, you know, as individuals, entrepreneurs, consumers start to figure out what they want as people, there is going to be a very high demand of 
climate or sustainability based solutions and we see pretty much every single brand which has sustainability anywhere let's say in the fashion space or clothing space even if it's not completely you know effective is adopted by consumers at an alarmingly fast rate so there is going to be much more of like a bottom up demand of sustainability based solutions from these countries and a given that 60% of global population lives in asia and that the global the population in asia is also much younger for instance india's average age is 29 while average age of most of the european countries is 45 i feel the consumers and the entrepreneurs and innovators will collectively figure out the best solutions rather than a sort of rule based method hmm interesting what well, thank you so much well um I, I think now we'll take some questions from the um, audience. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the mm. chat function, or you can also raise your hand uh, so that we can bring you in. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to ask you, Kyohei, uh, do you also want to touch on what we just discussed about the uh, you know, rule makings and then and the difference of the Asian and Europe. Yeah, uh, rule making is very tough issue right now because, uh, uh, you know, most of the Asian countries have the different background and the regulations out right now. But for the technology wise, we already started a lot of the collaboration between Japan and the, you know, India and the other countries right now. Uh, Right now, for example, if I show one slide to show how the collaboration is ongoing between Japan and the other countries, uh, here is some of the example that the, you know, the collaboration of new technologies between Japan and the, the Asian countries. So if you look at this, for example, uh, with Australia, you know, Tokyo Gas and the Mitsubishi Corporation uh, is now doing the feasibility study on the carbon neutral methane in Australia. Uh, for example, in Lao, Hitachi Zosen, a Japanese company, and Renova investigate the green ammonia production, supply, and the commercialization. Uh, for example, on the left side, Sumitomo Forestry and the IHI to commercialize the uh, management of the tropical peatlands in Indonesia. So this business is somehow related to the Avisense, the technology for the monitoring of the forest the, the you know, shield to conservation kind of things. So by starting this kind of the technological collaboration between Asia and Japan and the other countries, you know, we also have to think about how we can, you know, set up the rules for, you know, between the Asia, uh, you know, and then think about how we can standardize that this system and technologies and then sell it to the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, rather than uh, having a huge, you know, the systems of the rules, but starting from the collaboration of the, this technology and think about how we can, you know, expand this technology to the rest of the world and how to standardize it. That is a kind of the, the hint for us to think about the global rule making uh, through the Asia. Well, that, that was really good to, to visualize and then help us understand what's going on. Um, Ravi, would you like to, it, it seems like, um, I think we have a few minutes, a few more minutes. And um, if you could just uh, um, wrap up our discussion and then what's your take on this uh, session? Yeah, no, I think I'm happy to do that. I think it's very clear that Asian countries have their own imperative around decarbonization. Uh, companies, communities, governments do take it very seriously. The impacts are acutely felt. The consequences are understood. Plans are underway um, at different speeds in different countries and different industries to decarbonize. But it is happening. Um, innovation, technology, uh, measurement, monitoring, you know, mm -hmm. will play a key role in all of that. But, you know, I think we can say as a panel probably that we're all optimistic that Asia mm -hmm. is taking its challenge um, seriously and will follow its own path, I believe, you know, towards mm -hmm. decarbonization um, without sacrificing its overall growth agenda um, and, you know, its commitment to its population. 
So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. that would be the summary. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's that. Thank you so much. Uh, Abby, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, definitely. I'm just adding on what Ravi said that, you know, as it's not just going to be like the growth without sacrificing the growth agenda. I think Asia will redefine its growth agenda, especially the younger Asian consumers and population of what it means to live and like what do they want from their companies and markets and economies. It might not be the same things, the same growth models that Western countries have per se followed. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just take one example that almost 50% of wardrobes in the US and UK actually go to landfills without being worn more than five times. So you do have fashion industry, which contributes 10% carbon emissions, 20% with water, which manufactures all these clothes in Vietnam and Bangladesh, which are sold by H&M in New York, goes to the wardrobe and then goes to the landfill in Chile and in Patagonia and like, you know, uh, Argentina. So I hope very much that Asian consumers do not follow that same trend. Uh, I think currently the wave is in that direction, but it's changing very rapidly. And there is going to be a lot more innovations like Blue Sky, which are going to be introduced. I'm very bullish about climate tech investments and climate tech startups. Mm -hmm. I think the next mm -hmm. series of 100, 200, 500 companies that will emerge in the Asian subcontinent, Asian continent, are going to be having sustainability and climate at the core of it. So it's not going to be like you know, just a sustainability company, but even a fashion company, even a food delivery company, we're all going to have sustainability at the very center of it. And we are going to see a very dramatic shift in four to five years on how we think about climate tech. It's not going to be one-off investment. It's going to be the primary investment. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. Uh, Kyohei, would you like to um, add anything? Yeah, I'm also, I'm also pretty much positive for the you know, transformation of the society to the, towards the carbon neutrality in Asia. Uh, today, I'm very much encouraged by looking at the, the, you know, the talks from these two gent gentlemen and, then, uh, and the Abbeys, because uh, uh, climate tech is one of the, you know, you know, the key you know, areas for the new investment right now. In the U.S., you know, in the Western coast, there is a lot of the booms for the climate techs, because the U.S. is basically trying to you know, uh, you know, uh, solve the, the, the climate issues by the technologies, while the European countries are trying to solve it by the rules making. Uh, in Asia, we have to, in between the Europe and the, you know, the U.S., and then, you know, what is good is, uh, you know, from uh, India or from Japan, you know, a lot of the climate techs is now booming. So we have uh, different choices of say, the investment as well as, you know, the, you know, the, the booster for the, you know, the development of the new, you know, the carbon neutral societies by the technology. So it, it's really challenging, but uh, it's also quite exciting for all of us. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, well, unfortunately, we um, have to uh, uh, wrap up now. And uh, But before you go, please make sure to, uh, there's a survey uh, there on the, on the right side the, the uh, screen for the audience. So uh, if you could fill up before you go, that would be uh, great. Um, again, well, uh, it was it was terrific session, and then I, I myself learned a lot from from the, the speakers. Uh, thank you very much for the insight, insightful discussion, and then um, and then I I hope everyone enjoyed watching this section. And then um, thank you so much again for uh, the three speakers, which is, uh, gave us a great um, talk. Well, thank you very much. And then, and um, I am going to say goodbye for now. And uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you.